Good evening, everyone. Uh, pleasure to talk to you tonight. Uh, my name is Dr. Mike Walton. I am a physician here in Arlington, and also I'm on the pulpit committee of Arlington Bible Fellowship Church. So I would like to take a little bit of time tonight and kind of give you some information about the uh, COVID-19 uh, disease that's uh, attacked the world and hopefully give you a little bit uh, clearer information than you might be getting. Uh, there's so much information out there that can be very confusing. So I'm going to try and clarify, maybe give a little bit of information that you might not know about viruses. And uh, hopefully this will help you as you're figuring out how to handle the world situation. As I was coming in tonight, I was struck by the fact of how here we are on a Wednesday night. It's uh, now spring and coming on. We've got uh, lovely sunshine out tonight. The birds were singing as usual. and You know, life's going on. So hopefully, with some of this information, you won't have your life as disrupted. Maybe you'll be a little calmer about the whole situation. So let's go ahead and get started. So what we're facing at this time is what's called COVID-19. Now, COVID-19, as you see, comes from coronavirus disease 19. Uh, corona gives you the CO, virus, and disease. COVID-19 is the illness that you get from this. And the 19 comes from the fact that it was first... Uh, noted in 2019. It's not the 19th coronavirus. In fact, there are 32 or more different strains of coronavirus because they now believe there are three different strains of this uh, current virus. Um, and it's been around a long time, so when you see it on the back of the Lysol can or on the Clorox, it's uh, not some conspiracy. It's been there for a lot of years that, it that those things will kill human coronavirus. So the actual virus that causes this disease is called SARS-CoV-2. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, and this is the second one. The first SARS was CoV-1. It came about in 2003 when we first noticed that. And if you've heard of SARS before, that's this uh, first one from 2003, and this is a very similar cousin kind of virus to that SARS-CoV-1. There's also another coronavirus called MERS, and that's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, also called camel flu, and we'll discuss later why it's got the camel flu name to it. Uh, a lot of these coronaviruses do have that, uh, but these are a family of viruses, and this MERS, for in case, was a or in fact was a very significant disease, as we'll go over later. Now, where do we get the coronavirus from? Well, corona is a Latin word, or more modern days it's a Spanish, and it means crown. And when you look at the coronavirus, there are little probes that come off of the virus, and they have a crown shape. So that's where we have the coronavirus family. And again, the current covid or the current disease is COVID-19, and it's caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, okay? Um, here is a picture of the virus. Um, this is very typical of most viruses. Inside of this is a shell of, of uh, genetic material. It's either RNA or DNA. Different viruses have different um, genetic material inside of them, and we'll talk about that in a second. And then it's surrounded by a protein shell. So a little bit of information about a virus, or what's called virology. A virus is a non-living organism. This thing is not alive, and so you cannot kill it. You can destroy it, but you can't kill it. And that's why antibiotics don't work on viruses, because they kill living organisms, and this is not living. Now, how is that? Well, think of a paper bag. I mean, you can't kill a paper bag. You can burn it, you can shred it, but you can't kill it, and the virus is the same way. 
And this virus needs a living cell in order to reproduce. It can't reproduce on its own. In fact, this can't move on its own. It has to be blown along by the currents around it, and that's why a sneeze or a cough transmits it, and that's how it kind of is like a taxi for it. It doesn't survive long when it's outside of a living organism, and that's why, you know, how long will something live on a surface? Uh, the HIV virus, which everyone's heard of, will only last for a few seconds outside of a living organism, and different viruses last for different times when they're outside of a living organism. So it's really dependent on a living organism in order to reproduce itself. Now, you'll see these little probes sticking out of there, and that's what gave it a crown-like look that they call it a coronavirus. And in this depiction of it, you'll see they look like they have little suction cups on the end, kind of almost like uh, the suction cups on an octopus tentacle. Or um, this actually, this whole structure kind of has the look of like the legs on a starfish as it would move around and starfish can hang on the side of the fish tank because of these probes. And that is actually how it suctions on to a living cell and sticks on to the living cell. Then through these probes, it will tear into the living cell's outer shell, and it will inject its DNA or RNA into that living cell. Now, this outer protein shell is called a capsid. Now, just for reference, here's an actual uh, picture of these viruses, and you can see that those little tentacles are really hard to see and inside in the yellow area, that would be the RNA or DNA of the virus. And then their outer capsid shell, which is darker here. And of course, you can see here they don't follow order, so they're not observing uh, social distancing at this point in time. So kind of back to this picture again. Again, there's this RNA or DNA in the center of this with the protein on the outside of it. And it'll attach to a living cell inject its RNA or DNA into the cell, and then it'll basically take over that living cell. And every one of your cells has the same RNA and DNA in it with different sequences. Of course, we have one creator, so there's one baseline uh, genetic code. And even non-living organisms do contain this, as the virus shows. So basically, its RNA and DNA will interact with your RNA and DNA and turn your cell into a virus factory. And you'll start making thousands of these inside of your cell until it can't hold anymore and your cell will burst and die. And then it will spread thousands of these little things all over the rest of your body and you'll start getting more and more virus in your system. This, as we'll talk later, is where the incubation period of a virus comes from and why with this virus it can be 10 to 14 days after you first inhale it until you start showing signs of being sick. And that's how it's building up inside of your system by taking over and destroying more and more of your cells. And the number of cells it destroys will determine how sick you get. Okay? Now what you have to look at, and you really have to marvel at this, I mean, this is a God weapon we're looking at right here. God made this. He made this to create problems like disease. Okay? We are not going to defeat this. And we'll talk later about some of the weapons that God has given us to defeat it. And we've got to really uh, look at that and use that as we're... Uh, kind of calming ourselves down about this disease. Now, many of these viruses, and, and COVID viruses in particular, start out in animals, and then they can transfer to people. So the SARS-CoV-1, which is the famous SARS, was first noticed in monkeys and then in cats. The current SARS-CoV-2 that we're dealing with, they think comes from bats, though it could be other animals. The MERS that we discovered from the Middle East was seen in bats and then, of course, from camels. So that's where it gets the name camel flu. The problem is this is not a flu, and you have to realize this. Viruses, now, flu is a virus, but this is not a flu. And that's when we get into some of the symptoms. You have to realize that 
Unlike flu, it's not going to affect your intestinal tract. That's why everybody out there buying up all the toilet paper really doesn't know what they're dealing with here. But it's not a flu. Now, famous flus include like H1N1. That was the Spanish flu from 1918 to 1919, and that killed more people than World War I had killed. That same flu came back in 2009 and 2010, and it was called the swine flu. Swine because, guess what, it came from pigs. They had it first, and then we got it. Other flus of note would be the bird flu or avian flu. You've probably heard of that. And that has come from um, birds, chickens in particular. And guess what? That came from the same region of China. There's been the Asian flu, the Hong Kong flu. You kind of get the idea here that these things start in Asia, and that's because of the diet of the people in Asia. I mean, they will eat more raw meat. They'll eat bats. Um, they'll take eggs, fertilize the eggs, wait until the chick is almost ready to hatch. Then they'll open up the shell and they'll eat that chick live. And so they tend to get these transmitted to them a little sooner than we do in our society. So these things often will come from the oriental um, region of the world. Okay. Now... The good news is these viruses are changing all the time. We call that change a mutation. So it'll start off in the monkey. It'll be causing problems for the monkeys. Then it will change to a form where now it starts to infect humans and cause problems in humans. Thank goodness God keeps that mutation continuing. And pretty soon it mutates into a form that no longer bothers humans. And this is going to be the way that the SARS-CoV-2 is ultimately defeated. God's going to change it, and it's not going to bother us anymore, if he decides to. Now, you can see that in the Spanish flu here, where it took nearly 100 years until it came back and started bothering people again. So, you know, we're going to see that happen. MERS, which was much worse than the current SARS-CoV-2, mutated, and it's gone for now. It may be back again someday. So, again, that's one of the ways that this will probably be uh, combated. And, and by the time we get around to having immunizations and having treatment for it, it probably won't be around anymore to cause problems. In fact, the swine flu was declared by the World Health Organization to be an unstoppable pandemic, meaning it was going to kill us all. Two months later, nobody had it. It had converted and it was gone. So, you know, that tells you how much man's science knows about God things. Now, how does, the, how does this get transmitted? And this... Actually, this slide is a little misleading, and I need to go back and explain this. COVID-19, which you're going to hear all the time, that is the disease. If you become sick, you have COVID-19. It's the SARS-CoV-2 is the virus, and that's important, and we're going to talk about that later. But how do you get the SARS-CoV-2 virus? Well, it's transmitted in several ways. Number one is personal contact. You coming directly in contact with someone who has it. Next is these aerosolized droplets or the cough or what we call a cough splatter. We've all experienced that when somebody's coughed or sneezed on you and all of a sudden you got all these droplets on your body and you got to wipe it off. The cough splatter in the, most, in the strongest lung could maybe get out there five feet from the end of your nose, which is why social distancing is to be six feet. So you've got that buffer foot, so you, if somebody coughs around you, you're not going to get splattered, and so you're not going to get sick directly from their splatter. Now, the third way that it's passed is through surfaces. Somebody coughs on a surface, or they cough in their hand, they grab a doorknob, you come along, you grab the doorknob, and then you rub, okay, um, your nose, your mouth, your eyes, now you have it in your system, okay? Now, this is an area that is kind of interesting right now with this uh, SARS-CoV-2. At first, they didn't think that the virus was really transmitted off of surface, surfaces, and they were telling you, Oh, somebody's got a cough on you to get it. 
But if you've heard of the Diamond Princess, which is the cruise ship that had to sit out off of uh, Tokyo for nearly a month while the people sat in there and were all sick, once they got all the people off of there and they've been checking that boat, they now realize that it's up to 17 days it took until the CoV, or well, the SARS-CoV-2 was no longer on the surfaces, and that was even after some cleaning. So this can actually survive on surfaces quite a bit longer than your average virus, which adds to why it's so much more contagious. It seems to be easily spread from one person to another. And the thing here is even healthy looking people can spread it. And that goes back to how we talked about how the virus works. There's that two to 14 days that you have it, but you don't know you have it, okay? And we'll also talk about the fact that a lot of people have it that will never have any symptoms from it, but they can spread it to other people, okay? As it's invading your cells, turning them into virus factories, you start shedding more and more of the virus as time goes by, and you become more and more contagious to other people. Now, most contagious people, or you're most contagious when you're sick, because then obviously you've got a lot of growth and it's killing a lot of your cells and affecting you. So then every time you cough or sneeze, then you're going to be passing it on to other people. And they don't think there's too much sneezing associated with this one, but there is a lot of coughing. And then especially when you get to the point of having a fever, when your body's actively fighting this, then you tend to be shedding more of the virus and that tends to be a time when you're a little bit more likely to have problems. Now, again, we need to do social distancing. They're that six feet, so you avoid the cough splatter. And then you need to keep away from touching your eyes, your mouth, or your nose. Now, the mucous membranes, that's the inside of your eyelids, your mouth, inside of your nose, are where the virus can get into your body the quickest. The thick skin of your body often can keep the virus out but it gets in in these mucous membranes. So now that's why, you know, if you touch something, you need to wash your hand quick and not touch your nose, your mouth, or your eyes. And this is very difficult to do. In fact, if you'll see the governor and the doctors and the other people giving you these talks, you'll see them again and again rubbing their eyes, touching their nose. This is human instinct. We can't prevent it. But that's why you need to wash your hands a lot. So this is why medical personnel and people that are lucky enough to have it will have on face masks and goggles and gloves and gowns. And these are called PPEs, and this you'll hear a lot. This is personal protective equipment. And this keeps you, hopefully, from catching this virus. However, you have to know how to properly use it. Because if you put a mask on and later you take and grab it with your hand and take it off and then don't wash your hand immediately, guess what? You've got virus on your hand and if you rub your eyes or your mouth or your nose, you potentially can catch this. Now hand washing is important and it needs to be hot water. They'll tell you a lot that it can be cold, okay? But hot is better because cold stuns a virus and it won't grow as quickly but it doesn't destroy it. Hot water or heat destroys the virus. It melts that protein coating, that capsid that we talked about, and then all the genetic material, the RNA and DNA, just kind of spills all over the place and quickly dries out and is of no use. So heat is a key. Should be about as hot as you can stand and for 20 to 30 seconds. Okay? Now, soap. Any kind will do. Soap says it's bactericidal. That means it'll kill bacteria. Now, well, that's an advertising ploy. I don't know how much it kills, but the purpose of soap is to lift the stuff off of your skin, and then the water can sweep it away. So you get all the virus off of your skin if you use soap. Hand sanitizer will work, but it's got to be 70% alcohol to really kill this stuff. So when you see people that are out there saying, oh, you know, I'm buying alcohol so I can clean at my house. Well, it would have to be 140 proof alcohol, so you'd probably have to find your local moonshiner to get something that's good enough to really kill this if you're going an alcohol route. So that might be a convenient excuse for people to uh, use alcohol. On surfaces, Lysol will kill it. 
Clorox wipes will clear, kill it. If you can't find those because everybody's raided them from the, your local Myers, bleach water will work. And you can find recipes of how to make the bleach water and you just put it in a squirter bottle and squirt it on the surface. You've got to let this stuff sit there for a couple of minutes before you just wipe it right back off so that it has a chance to destroy that protein layer, that capsid, and then um, do its job. Now, another thing that works very well for humans is Listerine, okay? You should have some Listerine, gargle with it. Um, Listerine works really good in your body at destroying bacteria and virus, okay? So don't put Lysol on or in your body. Uh, don't put Clorox wipes on or in your body. Don't put bleach water in your body. Listerine will take care of it for you fairly good, okay? Now, let's talk about the actual disease itself. And again, I want to point this fact out, okay? There's the virus and there's the disease. So now we're talking about COVID-19. If you get the disease, you will develop a fever with this almost all the time. There are cases of people who have the COVID-19 who did not have a fever. Um, and that has to do with their pre-existing conditions and whether they can actually mount a fever because a mounting a fever is a defense mechanism that God has given us. You do not have a fever until you're 100.4 or above. So 99 is not a fever, folks. Okay? And again, we're going to talk about you really should let the fever go if you want to get over this. You get a cough, which then makes you more contagious because you're spreading it. If it gets deeper into your lungs, because this is a respiratory infection, it's going to cause bronchitis, it's going to cause pneumonia. If it gets deeper into your lungs, you'll get shortness of breath, you'll get the chest pain, you'll get the aches and the fatigue. Okay? Now, you're going to go 2 to 14 days as an incubation period. That's how long it takes for the average person to get sick from the SARS-CoV-2. Once you get sick, it usually takes about eight days, on average of what we know, until you would get into the pneumonia phase. Once you get pneumonia, it depends on your overall strength beforehand, you'll see the numbers. And if you're looking these up, you'll see the number of deaths and you'll see the number of people that recovered. These are people that got the COVID-19 that recuperated. And you'll see that's a much bigger number than the number of people who died. Okay, they don't point that out too often. But it's taken up to 28 days for people to have the pneumonia before they've died. So that's why some of these death numbers are from people who've been sick for quite a long time. Now, your most susceptible people will tend to be people over 65. Well, they're most susceptible to everything, and that's just part of God's plan. And then if you have pre-existing -con pre conditions. Now, what are those? cardiovascular disease, diabetes, COPD or asthma, hypertension, and cancer. Now, why are these conditions a problem? Well, cardiovascular disease, that means that you've got plugged blood vessels around your heart. You may have had a heart attack. You may be days away from having a heart attack. You may have some damage to your heart muscle that makes your heart muscle weaker. Well, why do these people have problems? When you get a pneumonia, it makes your heart work a lot harder. Fluid builds up, it's harder to pump the blood into your lungs, and it's going to trigger your cardiovascular disease. So a lot of people who have pneumonia, what they really die of is a heart attack from the strain of fighting off the pneumonia. So these people are at more risk. Diabetes, why that? Well, diabetes, the way it works, it reduces your immune system. Those white blood cells that we're going to talk about again in a minute when we talk about your natural defenses, they don't work too good in somebody who has diabetes, or at least they're not as efficient. So you're more likely to go into the disease state if you have diabetes and not be able to fight it off. COPD or asthma. COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's emphysema, chronic bronchitis, diseases of that nature, and then asthma. Well, these people already have diseased lungs. So the lung tissue is not going to be able to stand up and fight against the virus as well. And if they get the pneumonia, their airways are going to tighten up. They're going to have lower oxygen levels. They're going to have more trouble fighting it off. And these are the people that tend to die. 
Hypertension goes back along with cardiovascular disease is that when you have high blood pressure, then you're more susceptible to the effects of the pneumonia and causing more problems, including heart attacks. And then cancer. Well, that should be obvious. I mean, we all know cancer uh, victims that are fighting their cancer, getting their treatment. They might wear a mask. They can't shake hands. They, when they're getting their treatment, they can't even come to church. Their immune system has been affected by the cancer. And in fact, a lot of cancers are now they're finding are caused by different viruses. And their immune system is down because of their fight against cancer and the treatment that they're being given. So, of course, they're more susceptible to having them. Okay? So these are the people that will get the COVID-19 disease. Okay? Now, what's the treatment? There isn't any. It's a virus. Nothing will kill it that we know of, okay? Now, that's not 100% true. God makes the virus. God also provides us a way to fight it. We fight it with two main things. Number one is a fever, okay? Viruses do not like heat. Heat destroys that protein coating and therefore destroys the virus. And they move slower, okay? They don't, they get kind of sticky from that protein as it starts to melt. They get stuck on surfaces. They don't like cold either, but cold just basically freezes them for the time, but heat destroys them. Also, you have what are called white blood cells or leukocytes. These white blood cells, they're eating machines. And they will eat these viruses and destroy them. And you, the white blood cells, as you get sicker, you make more and more of them. They're like the soldiers in your natural army. They're going to kill these viruses by eating them and destroying them in, internally. So you want to have the white blood cells. The white blood cells work really good in heat. They like the hot. And so when you have a fever, your white blood cells work better. So you've got to let nature do its job. So don't treat your fever if it's below 102 for most people. You can handle that. And in fact, this is, a, this is where you need to use the good old treatment of crawl in bed, put more blankets on, sweat it out. This will kill the virus quicker and you will get on your way to recovery. Now, if you get over 102, go ahead and treat yourself. Tylenol has been found to be safe if it works for you. And now they know ibuprofen is safe as well. So either one of those, and ibuprofen is Motrin or Advil, and you can use that or Tylenol. Okay? Um, again, the heat's bad for the virus. It's good for those leukocytes. Going back to the whole virus, a virus itself is about 100 nanometers in size. To give you a kind of an idea, a blood cell in your body is 6,000 nanometers in size. So these are tiny and those white blood cells, they're big. They will eat thousands upon thousands of these viruses and help destroy them for you. And this is how you're going to fight it off. That, and as we said, these viruses keep mutating and will change into a form that don't bother people. At least that's what we've experienced in the past with these. So another treatment is once you get sick, now you stay home. Stay away from other people. Just use common sense. Cover your mouth. Do your social distancing because now you could be passing it on to other people, okay? And as we said, let yourself have that fever. Now, a couple of things to talk about is, um, and I'll move on to this slide. Obviously, statistics and, you know, Oh, one more thing on treatment. Chloroquine is now being touted that this might take care of it. Well, chloroquine takes care of a virus that causes malaria. So it's an antiviral, so it may have some promise. Chloroquine phosphate, but you have to be careful. If they tell us that chloroquine is going to kill this, you need to get it from your doctor. Don't be like the guy in Arizona who found chloroquine phosphate in a container at home and started taking it. And then uh, 
when the doctors uh, were talking to his wife about why he had died, they found that this was chloroquine phosphate that's used in fish tank cleaner. So you're not a fish, you're not a fish tank, you need to have human doses of chloroquine phosphate. So see your doctor, they'll get it for you. Now, let me also give you a word of caution here. If chloroquine phosphate is found to be successful, Los Angeles and New York will get chloroquine phosphate. It'll be a long time till we get it. We're a flyover country, and that's why we're not having as many tests done around here as you're hearing in the big cities. It's weighted, and the population centers will get treated first, but that does make sense because if you know more than half the cases in the country are in New York City, in populated areas, it's going to be a bigger problem. So, of course, they're going to get the resources first. Now, testing. There's not a lot of tests around. Part of the problem is that, you know, it takes a while to come up with a test when you first find a disease. And around here, we didn't really know about it until the first of the year. So, you know, they've got to ramp up production. They've got to bring the, the swabs around. And then, once the doctor or the nurse takes the swab from your nose real fun process you then have to develop it in the lab and they're also having shortages of the developer in the lab and then the other thing is there's only so many lab techs they're not growing on trees and you can't just grab any guy off the street and have him do one of these tests appropriately so now it's taking longer and longer to get the results back because there's a backlog at the laboratory but even if the test was available there's a couple of things to remember here. How accurate is it? In some of the studies, there's, a, there's indication that it could have a 50% false negative. What that means is 50% of the people, or pardon me, false positive in this case, 50% of the people who get a positive test may not have anything, okay? Which means probably there's about a 50% false negative, which means it's probably about as good as flipping a coin. Now, it might be better than that, but we're not quite sure. And again, there's another thing to remember. Now, this is very important to remember. When they test you, they're testing to see if you have the SARS-CoV-2 virus in your system. You may have the SARS-CoV-2 and never get COVID-19. In fact, some studies are indicating that 90 to 95 percent of the people who would test positive for SARS-CoV-2 would never get COVID-19. We don't even know how many people have it around here because we're not testing everybody. And if we were to test everybody, then all that would tell you is that the time they had the swab in your nose, you didn't have any SARS-CoV-2 in your system. In this anywhere from two, well, two hours if you're the president, or if you're a multimillionaire or a basketball player, to, you know, eight days in some cases if you're just a common guy on the street for them to get that processed. In those eight days, you've got eight days to catch it. So, you know, it's kind of like trying to grab a tiger by the tail. And that's the way all these statistics are. But again, you've got to remember, there is a difference between having a positive test and having the COVID-19 disease. The best way to think about this is many of you will know the name Magic Johnson, famous basketball player who, because of his basketball lifestyle, announced over 30 years ago that he had HIV, human immunodeficiency virus. He had the virus. HIV causes a disease called AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, from which many people die. You don't die from having HIV, you die from having AIDS. And Magic Johnson has had 30 continued years here on the world where he has not died of AIDS, and he may never die of AIDS. Same thing here, you can have SARS-CoV-2 and never get COVID-19, the disease. They're not quite reporting that too well of how many people they've been testing that have it that aren't sick, but as of yesterday, the CDC in Atlanta had admitted that they had tested 88,000 people. 
44,000 of them were positive, okay, for the test, but they don't really tell you how many of them had the COVID-19, okay? So here's some statistics. This is from the other day, but of course, this, this is constantly changing. And you're going to see this constantly changing because that's the way it is with the virus. As we do more testing, we're going to find more people with it. I mean, if we tested everybody in the world for this, and there's 7.5 billion of us, there might be 5 or 6 billion people that would test positive. How many of them are sick? That's the question. So 422,566, that was of yesterday, in the world... Um, today's count was 463,387. Sounds like a big jump, but you got to remember, 7.5 billion people, okay? Deaths, 18,887 yesterday. Today, at the end of the day, it was 20,902. Sounds horrible, but remember, that's how many people on that top number who had COVID-19, Okay? They have it. Of those, 18,000 died. That's 4.5% death rate. Okay? Sounds horrible. But look how many people have recovered from it now and don't have it anymore. And since they've recovered, they've got antibody. And for now, they're safe from catching it again. And we don't know how long that antibody is going to last. And there will be antibody testing out there so we can see if this is like flu where you have to get an immunization every year. Or is it more like, remember, chicken pox, where they told you you get it once and you don't get it again? And we weren't quite right about that either, because now we have shingles, and that's chicken pox virus. But, again, you go a long time, you don't get chicken pox again, per se. So, again, having a positive test doesn't mean you have the disease. Okay? Now, another thing to remember when you look at these numbers so they don't terrify you so much. Okay. Let me get a drink here. Excuse me. Um, so, in the world every day, out of 7.5 million, 150,000 people die. So over a one-month period, 4.5 million people die every month, month in and month out, year in and year out, in a world this size. 4.5 million in a month. Okay, now we've had 20,000 people die from this disease and that goes all the way back to last September when the first death was recorded in China. So by comparison, that's not a particularly high death rate. Okay, so don't be terrified by the numbers and don't dwell on the numbers. You got to think outside the box. In the United States, we have 54,453 cases, of which we have 737 deaths. That's a 1.4% death rate, quite a bit lower than the rest of the world. We would expect that. We're an industrialized, advanced nation. We know how to separate people. We know how to take care of the sick a little better than they do in some other countries. So we're going to tend to have a lower death rate. Now, that, may, that number may go up because there's a lot of sick people that may ultimately die from this. But again, it, it's not going to devastate our society, or at least it doesn't appear that it has the ability to devastate our society like you might think if you're watching 24-7 news all the time. Now, in the United States, eight to 10,000 people die every day. That would be 300,000 people over the course of a month. Okay, now in a month of deaths in the United States, 737 people have died from this. 737 compared to 300,000 that would have died anyway. We have to look at that 737 people that died of this and say, would they have died? How many of them would have died anyway during that one month? And that can skew the figures a little bit as well. We're now getting reports out of uh, Italy, where it's supposed to be the worst, that of the people that have died over there in this great, great epidemic, only 12% of them has the doctor sign that their cause of death was COVID-19. The others have died of other causes. So they were already sick people or elderly 
that were going to pass away anyway. So it's not quite as bad as they say. Now, that doesn't mean that you go out there and willy-nilly, I'm invincible. But don't sit in your house and be panicked. As spring's coming on, open up your windows. That's good. Get out in your backyard. Go for a walk. You're safer outside than you are in your house with all those surfaces that you could be touching. So get out. Get to doing. Hopefully we're going to all get back to work. That involves discussion of herd immunity, which means how do you get over this? In the end, you've got to build up antibodies. You've got to be exposed to it to build up the antibodies so that you can fight it off. So, yeah, ultimately we're going to need to get back out and get to functioning again. And just a couple of other words about this. Even at 4.5% death rate, and if it holds there, yeah, I mean, for the people that have it and their family members, it's catastrophic. But that MERS that we talked about before, the camel flu, it had a 35 to 40% mortality rate. Ebola, 90% mortality rate. If you got it, only 10% of the people were going to recuperate. Okay? You want to talk about something bad, we go back to the, the uh, pneumonic plague or bubonic plague. We talk about a 2 to 14 day incubation period and then 8 days until you get into pneumonia and sometimes 28 days until you die with this current COVID-19. The bubonic plague was so bad because from the time you would come in contact with it until you were dead could be 18 to 24 hours. So that's rapid spread, okay? Not quite what we're dealing with here. So again, the world has survived more than this. So, again, if you have any questions, if there's anything that's, you know, you don't quite understand, I'll be at church. Well, no, I won't be at church. Send in the answer, or send in your questions. Mail them in. We'll try to compile them. We may do another talk like this to answer your questions. We'll kind of see how that goes. But the big thing to remember, don't be afraid to get outside. And we are going to get through this. God's going to keep us around. Okay? Be in your Bible. Be praying regularly. And again... When people are scared, they look to the Lord. They're more receptive. Take this opportunity to be witnessing to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family. I can't think anything more tragic than to not talk to them and then have them die of something like this disease. But every day in our entire life, we face disease like this. We'll get through this. God bless you. And uh, I hope he finds you well. Have a good evening.